Always a pleasure to be asked to give what is called an inspirational talk. That means I don't have to come up with any solutions, just inspiration, and then you come up with the solution, and that's so much easier for me. But basically, uh, I think it's fair to say uh, food has to be safe, period. It makes no sense that the food we produce and the food we eat makes consumers or ourselves sicker than before we ate it. So food has to be safe, and it should make us generally more healthy, not less healthy. And that's, of course, what the consumers, rightly so, expect, particularly if they bought the food. If they produced it themselves in their own garden, maybe they have a slightly different view. If you're a food purchaser, you expect the food to be safe. Goes without saying. However, speaking as a food safety expert, I also know that food can never be completely safe. That's the unfortunate <laughs> case of the matter. We can never achieve 100% safety in food. No matter how we produce it, there's also always the potential that something can go wrong and something always will go wrong, either because humans screwed up or new hazards emerged that we had not prepared for. So basically, we are in the classical Houston, we have a problem situation. We really have consumers demanding something which somehow we, producers, whoever, systems can never deliver. And therefore, I guess the case is that we both, as I guess also is the idea behind the 50% reduction target, we have to be realistic but also ambitious, and find the right balance between realism and ambition. And of course, targets are set so that new targets can always be set when you have achieved them. So that's the beauty of targets. And obviously, as I'm sure you heard just from Fleming and others, the situation is far from perfect when we talk about food safety. There is plenty of room for improvement. One in 10 people fall ill each year from a food safety condition, 420,000 deaths globally, an estimate could be more, could be less, but those are big numbers. And aiming just for cutting that is half when you look at the, let's say, public health implications may seem as a not so ambitious target. But on the other hand, as we know, working in food safety, there are no magic bullets. So we have to be, again, pragmatic, realistic, and innovative, which this meeting is about, to come up with new solutions. Probably my big role model, Louis Pasteur, who invented pasteurization, came up with one of the most, at that time, innovative and revolutionary uh, approaches to food safety, but even with pasteurization, the bare figure showed that was not a silver bullet. And I would argue in food safety, there are no silver bullets. We need many different approaches, many different solutions. We need research, we need innovators who can push the boundaries, challenge the convention and the norms of traditional food business and move us forward. Another issue when it comes to food safety is that food safety is the responsibility of the many. Farmers, slaughterhouses, manufacturers, distributors, outlets, commercial kitchens, and even the consumers themselves. So obviously, many sharing a responsibility means also that responsibility may somehow evaporate into thin air in the stages between the many participants in the value chain or the production chain or the food safety chain, whatever you call it. So it's very important that we make sure that responsibility action does not disappear, but is actually taken where it creates most food safety benefit. That's why also the public sector plays a major role in developing rules, standards, guidelines, and not least facilitate and conduct research stimulate innovation so that new tools, new technologies, new approaches to food safety are always brought about. Innovation 
comes both from private and public sector, as we heard from Fleming Wiesenbacher. And in my experience, the very best comes if the two sides cooperate, because somehow the actual production has to, let's say, be attuned to the regulatory environment and to the system that somehow also oversees the quality. Food safety has to, uh, let's say, has to be thought up in a holistic view, and this is what this slide shows. Um, when I was asked to give this presentation and I saw the 50% target, I was uh, reminded of uh, an event many years ago. It was in 1995. Uh, it was uh, not in this room, but another room close to Parliament, where the then Minister of Food, Agriculture and Fisheries had invited a lot of experts and a lot of parliamentarians to come together and discuss the salmonella crisis. Denmark was in a very deep salmonella crisis. Disease incidences was growing. It was all over the media and everyone was alarmed. And uh, they had challenged uh, experts to come on stage and offer suggestions for solutions to this problem. And I remember at the end of uh, this long day, I was uh, on stage trying to sum up some of the experts' views on what we could do and how we could go about, and one parliamentarian got up and said, if we give you the 180 million you are asking for, can you guarantee 50% reduction in human salmonellosis? And I think we had not indicated anything about what would actually be the effect if they gave us all this money. And, and I put my head in the hangman's loop and said, yes. <laughs> and since then, I was a little bit worried. But the good thing is, good thing is, and this is a busy slide, don't even try to understand it, but the good thing is that we succeeded. We succeeded because we had set ourselves a target, which was actually very ambitious, but we had some ideas from industry, from experts, from regulators on how we could connect all the dots and actually implement programs that would achieve it. And we succeeded with the investment from government, which brings me probably to one of my also important conclusions. It's very hard to achieve food safety without investment. And I think food safety investment should come both from public and private because there is a private responsibility, but there is also so much unknown in food safety that public sector also has to accept some kind of responsibility and chip in if we really want proactive action that moves the boundaries forward. Because food safety is a little bit, as I came to think about, like fighting the Hydra. You cut off one head, and immediately two new heads emerge. Food safety is unpredictable. And while it's fair, of course, to say, yes, ideally producers bear the full responsibility of the safety of the food, there is also so much unpredictability involved that public sector, universities, and others have to somehow take responsibility and share that responsibility with the producers. We need to constantly be aware of food safety. We can never be complacent. Every time one problem has been solved, new problems will emerge. And that's why we need constantly to develop new tools, new rapid diagnostic testing methods, new smart digital solutions powered by the informatics that we now have available, new smart genomic solutions where we can high throughput sequence pathogens and foodstuffs and make all these dots that actually explains how things are moving about. And the blockchain solution that Fleming mentioned is, is one key to this traceability thing, which is somehow key to actually having targeted food safety approaches. So we need to put all this together and we can only do that if we collaborate and if we invest in research and innovation, otherwise we won't make it. So let's aim for the 50%. And when we have achieved that, let's make it 50 again, and then we do 50 again, and then we do 50 again. And eventually, those 50 remaining will be very small. So thank you very much for your attention.